Hi, this is Mashnu and it's day 16 of the middle game training. So I have a beautiful position for you again. Um, this time it's a game that was played in 1947 between Isaac Boleslavsky and Alexander Tolush. Um, Boleslavsky, a Ukrainian player who taught himself how to play chess at the age of 9. Now compared with the age where when um, young players nowadays start playing chess and become professionals it's, uh, it's quite old to uh, quite late to start at the age of nine to learn the rules but as you see even if you start late learning chess there's always the possibility that you uh, reach a high level and Polislavski was a very strong player in the uh, in the 40s 40s 30s 40s 50s um, he played in a match between the Soviet Union and the and, and the United States. There was a radio match in the 40s. I believe uh, I don't. I'm, I'm not sure in what year it was exactly. I believe 46, but I'm not sure. Um, and he was playing on board number three against the American player Ruben Fine. And he drew the first game, and the second game was won by Poloslavsky. He won the brilliancy prize for this uh, second game against uh, Ruben Fine. So perhaps some other time we'll have a look at that game. Um, let's go to this position right now because it's here black to move. I'll, I'll show you the move that black did here. It's knight f6 to d7 and we are going to look at the position from white's point of view. So here is the question that you all already expect here is to uh, pause the video and have a look at the position see what you find about this position what would you do here with white what are the characteristics why do you find that white is standing better here is he standing better or is it equal well have a look for yourself first and I'll continue my explanation in a few seconds alright well um, yes white is standing better here clearly we only need to compare the pieces to know that two black rooks inactive not connected two white rooks connected with each other with the option of doubling up the rooks perhaps on the f-file or bringing the a rook to e5 sorry whoops to, e5, to e, the e-file to advance the e-pawn eventually um, if we compare the light pieces undeveloped bishop here and to develop pieces right there. They are not still at the moment not at the, the most ideal squares but they are brought into play already and we have of course space advantage on this side of the board. So white is clearly standing better in this position. Black wants to trade queens. Why does black want to do that? Well because when you are facing an attack it's good to trade pieces so the power of the attack diminishes so black would love here for if, if white would take on, on e7 because then the queens are off of the board and uh, white can, uh, black can try to defend so what to do here with white um, the fact that we have our rooks with the possibility of connecting them and the fact that we have space advantage and that we can prevent this trading of queens means that we should look for ways to open some files open files for our rooks so there are different possible moves here that can be uh, can be correct for example queen to g3 queen to g3 is a very natural move to do here to prevent the trade of queens and threaten to take on d6 and in that case black probably plays knight to e5 blocking this uh, this uh, diagonal let's go back because there is another option bishop to g5 mm, it's not the not the very not a very beautiful one in the sense that black can defend here by blocking this diagonal and blocking also the f pawn and having much control on e5. So this would actually lead to a slow to, to slowing down the uh, the attack of white. 
Still white is standing better positionally, but the attack becomes a bit difficult. What white did in this position was that he played the move f6. Boleslavsky understood that opening the f-file was much more worth than a pawn, so he sacrifices a pawn to open the f-file. Now how should black take? Well, certainly not with the, with the g-pawn, because if he plays g takes f6, then bishop to h6 check, king goes to e8, and we already have things like bishop to g7 attacking the rook. Uh, if the rook moves, queen to h7, and we can also tr see if we can take on f6, so this leads to uh, difficulties for black. Um, oops, f6. So g takes f6 uh, weakens the h, uh, h6 square too much. If it takes with a knight, then bishop g5 is strong. We threaten to take on f6, so then again the g pawn must take, and we can take again with rook, and then put the other rook on the f file, rook a to f1, and we have strong play against this f7 point. point. In the game, uh, Alexander Tolus chose to take with the queen. Now it is a bit, bit risky, of course, because you place your queen on the same file as the rook on f1. But there is not really a way of um, making use of this right now. Bishop to g5, perhaps. Queen to g6. Still later black can try to play f6 to chase away this bishop and uh, try to have some uh, some defense there of f7 some blocking what was played here is the move queen to g3 still we have the option of taking on d6 of opening this f-file by, by moving away the bishop, so actually it's, it looks like slow move, but in fact it keeps all the tension and all the threats in the position. Here black played knight to e5, blocking this diagonal, and white continue with the principle of involving all the pieces in the attack. That's something that really is so useful especially in positions like this, where it's very difficult for black to use his rooks for the defense. So we must use as many pieces as possible to enter into this attack. And why did that? By playing bishop to b3. The bishop was doing not much here. Attacking c6, that was uh, well, not not something to, to 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 stay there. So bishop to b3, attacking f7. Now, black continue with king to e8, and here comes an important moment. Sometimes we are attacking and we get more or less obsessed by attacking and keep attacking, and it's very instructive to see how grandmasters sometimes decide not to continue a attack, an attack but to um, uh, simplify the position into a one position and this is what happened here so don't expect any firework here what happens here is that the white player knew how to win this position and he knew that he would sim he if he would simplify this position, he would still have an enormous advantage, and it would be uh, certain that he would uh, he would have winning chances. What he did here is he took on e5, and after queen takes e5, he took again on e5, and after d takes e5, now he took on f7. So, with this simplification. White is activating his rook on the 7th rank, attacking g7, has also the option of bringing the other rook to f7, and have active pieces. The knight can go to f3 or can go to c4 eventually to attack this 
this uh, this pawn on e5 that can be a weakness later so white keeps the advantage in this case by simplifying the position it's a different thing than if we would have traded queens in the beginning just to show you that let's go to that moment just for a moment um, right here knight to d7 was played if here queen takes queen we could say that's also simplification so why not do it here well after king takes there is a difference that we haven't opened yet the f-file so the power of these rooks entering is not there so here um, it's much more difficult to, to gain any advantage black is actually happy with this trade of queens you see later black could perhaps play rook to e8 king to f8 mm, the knight could go here so there are many defensive ideas or perhaps f6 and then knight to knight to e5 so that's the big difference let's compare this with the position where we left now it was let's say uh, here now if we simplify this position we get this open f file for both rooks entering on the seventh rank and that's a big difference so when we have the options of trading heavy pieces and simplify a position we always must ask ourselves what is then left behind do I still have an advantage after it or not let's see how the game continued bishop to d8 queen takes I'm oh, sorry, uh, rook takes d7. Now, why not defending this g7 pawn? Let's say that he would advance here to um, to continue. It would be possible, of course. Well, then still white has an advantage. He could, for example, play rook a to f1 or knight to f3. Knight to f3 looks very strong because the bishop now cannot go to c7 to defend the e5 pawn because then rook takes e7 oh, wait 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 is that correct yes it's correct I was just uh, looking at something else um, so that means that saving this pawn um, would lead to the loss of the e5 pawn most probably so we can say white has two threats here to play knight f3 and knight takes e5 and to take on g7 so black chose to play the, knight, the bishop to d8 with the idea of bringing the bishop to f6 that's the, the let's say the defensive threat that he has now uh, defending both pawns so something must be done right now and that's taking on g7 now he still he played bishop to f6 and the weak went, the rook went to f7 attacking this bishop on f6 the bishop goes to e7 now rook a to f1 so again activating all the pieces using their file that's the middle game plan that white is using a5 played by black a4 to stop any counterplay on the queen side b5 played now still finding trying to find some counterplay and now white makes the plan of using both rooks on the seventh rank rook to g7 you already guess what the possible next move will be it will be rook to f7 rook f1 to f7 or perhaps knight to f3 and then taking here there are many possibilities rook to b8 was played now and here white decided well it could have rook to f7 would have been a very good move and let's have no doubt about this uh, it was not played in the game but this of course could have been a very good uh, very good option if black by the way moved the bishop to f8 then the rook simply goes to g5 attacking again the e5 pawn uh, let's go back right here knight f3 was played so attacking the e5 pawn activating also the knight bishop to f6 again and now rook f7 one more time and here black didn't move the bishop to e7 because that would lead to knight takes e5 so what he did is he took on a4 actually um, offering one more trade of pieces trade the piece b3 bishop for the f6 bishop and white did it, white took on f6 
black token b3, c takes b3, rook takes b3, rook takes c6. If we evaluate this new position now, we can say that still black has an inactive piece there. There is a direct threat to take on c8, a threat to take this weak pawn on e5. On the other hand, this is actually the only weakness at the moment, well, two. These two, the two weaknesses in white's camp, but white's pieces are much more active, and we have the threat of taking the bishop. So bishop to d7 was played now. White moved the rook to a6, and here black did something that's actually instructive to, to understand from black or black's point of view. Perhaps many of us would now be um, actually more or less persuaded to take one of those pawns, the, the b2 pawn or the d3 pawn. But remember that we are slowly, slowly entering into an endgame now. And in an endgame, peace activity is the most important thing. So what Black did here is that he moved his king to e7 to activate the h8 rook. Besides that, there is also a tactic that cannot be allowed. If Black takes the d3 pawn or the b2 pawn, there is queen. Oh, I'm sorry, rook to um, a8 check, winning the rook here. But besides that, still the principle is look for activity when you're going towards an endgame. So king to e7 is also a way to activate this rook. But well, black has too many weaknesses, so white finds it the time now to strike and take the pawn on e5. Bishop to e8 was played now, and the other pawn fell. Black took on b2, and now a check on the 7th rank. Black has now two weak pawns on d4 and on h7. So white has two pawns up now. Actually, white has already, let's say, a winning position. If this is played correctly, white wins always. King to e6 was played, knight f3, rook to b4 to defend this pawn on d5. Now a check on g5, the king goes to d6. Let's have a nice variation here is king to e5, it leads to a checkmate after rook to a6 threatening rook to f5 checkmate um, there is no way to uh, to defend this if bishop to g6 then there is rook to e6 checkmate so this is how sometimes in an when you're entering an endgame also these mating patterns arise these tactics the king went to d6, rook f6 check, so now the king has to move forward. He goes to e5, and here more or less the same pattern arises. The rook goes to a6, defending the other rook, threatening checkmate, so black give one check and rook b2 check, king g3, and here there was the last move played was bishop to, to c6, well it was unnecessary because after this it's completely lost, we're going to be mated in one or two moves so here black resigned. Let's have a short look at the most important moments in this example let's go back, oh wait, oh, this, I can do this faster of course like this. Um, this is the moment where we started and the first important thing in this kind of positions where you have uh, an advantage because of this developed pieces and the pieces working together like the two rooks important to open files f6 played, beautiful move queen takes f6 now not trading the queens at this point knight to e5 bishop b3 to activate all the pieces and all the pieces are working together now on the f file looking at f7 that's the idea, king to e8 then the simplification, and after this we can enter in the seventh rank, taking of seven on f7. Bishop d8, take on g7, bishop f6, and now this activating of the of the other rook, bringing it to to f1. 
a5, it tries to find some counterplay on the queen side, black, but it doesn't work since the activity of, um, of white is much bigger. Now the weakness on e5 becomes a point attack of the rook, rook goes to f7, and after trading here we trade one more piece and we stay with this position where black has an inactive rook here and a weakness here and all the other pawns are in fact weak we can say almost all the other pawns. Rook takes e6 now threatening to take the bishop, bishop to d7, rook to a6 with a double threat to take the pawn and also to give this check on the back rank here we saw the principle of looking for activity. Now in this case it was not enough for black, but it is a good idea to play king to e7 to try to activate the other rook and also prevent this check on the back rank. Knight takes e5 now and we see that after trading some pieces we have material advantage but also more, perhaps more important in this position is the vulnerability of the black king. It's persuaded now to come forward and then we have this possible mating nets that start arising so after king to e5 rook to a6 this was in fact the moment that when black should have resigned he continued a few more moves and resigned here alright I hope you found this interesting and instructive to look at and you got some ideas for your own practice thanks for watching and I'll see you next time on YouTube bye bye